Hi, I'm Dan Cohen, and this is my colleague, Joan Fergazi Troiano. Um, we're excited to be here to present our project on um, a different take on scholarly communication. Um, I found the last session we went to um, uh, also intriguing, and I think um, which had some other models for open access publishing, and um, we'll leave ample time, I think, at the end to talk about maybe differences in, in models of publishing. Um, but where we want to start today is um, with a little bit about where this, this project came from, um, why we decided to uh, try a different take on, on publishing. Um, and a, as you can see here, we, we talk about it as being scholarship and publication the web way. We wanted to sort of think about scholarly communication starting with the web um, rather than with a print model. And so a lot of what we'll talk about today is differences in web-first publishing versus traditional academic journal publishing where you submit an article to be reviewed, um, it goes through some process. We tried to take our inspiration in the Press Forward Project from what was going out on the web, how the web reviews, aggregates, curates, validates material, and um, we'll show you some examples from that. Um, so. Uh, what we want to start out is uh, Joan and I both come out of, of, I guess, digital history or digital humanities more broadly. And one of the things that we've noticed over the past few years in digital humanities is that there's um, a lot of us who are already um, publishing, I guess, in air quotes, on the web. Um, people who have blogs. Uh, this is a uh, very promising grad student, uh, Ben Schmidt, um, who's a Princeton grad student um, working in digital history. Um, he has a terrific blog called Sapping Attention, and, and he writes very long, thorough, um, article-sized uh, pieces on his blog. Um, recently, he's been working with um, ships logs and uh, tracking uh, ships um, and also doing some text mining relating to that. And um, so there are lots of people like Ben out there, I guess, in the, in the DH community um, producing scholarship stuff that looks like scholarship but isn't in a journal, and also that would have a very hard time being in a traditional print journal. So he often has uh, videos of his visualizations on um, his site. Um, he has multimedia um, and um, things that would have to be flattened out to get into a print journal. He's working in a web-first way um, to put his scholarship up there. There are other um, genres, um, my colleague Steve Barnes, who's a Russian historian, has a group uh, blog with other Russian historians um, where they um, have different kinds of genres than you normally see uh, in uh, a regular academic uh, journal. So when new books come out, they have a very rapid conversation emerging around those new scholarly works on the blog. Um, here's one about Gulag uh, Boss, which was a Soviet memoir, um, that they were able to have a kind of real-time discussion right on the blog about. They've also done um, analyses of old Soviet videos that they pull from YouTube and discuss in depth. Um, really kind of wonderful use, um, pedagogical use, and also scholarly use for, um, for this kind of web-first publishing. Um, there are terrific collaborative non-digital history kinds of things going on now. Um, Frog in a Well, which is a terrific um, uh, blog, a collaborative web blog of about 20 scholars in East Asian history. It's written in four languages, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, and English, um, and has really deep scholarship and discussion. Again, web first, just on a blog um, without the intervention of, uh, of an academic journal. There are institutional um, sites um, that span uh, many different places and disciplines, like Niche, which is the network in Canadian history and environment, where you see geologists and, and climate scientists working with historians in a kind of interdisciplinary fashion to craft new forms of scholarship. Again, something you normally wouldn't see in a sort of generally siloed view of the academic, a kind of balkanized view where different um, disciplines like history and climate science would never kind of publish together or, or rarely talk to each other. This is a good example of a kind of web first place that these scholars can go and discuss um, relevant issues and sort of create scholarship. 
It includes things like podcasts and new media that, again, is hard to uh, find in uh, a print journal or cannot exist in a print journal. Um, uh, there's um, new kinds of publications, sort of incipient publications, Ant, Spider, Bee, um, which is also an environmental and digital publication, which has incredible rich visualizations, in this case an article on San Francisco Bay's Forgotten Past, where a scholar has taken satellite imagery and walked through how things have changed in the Bay over time, um, full color, uh, interactive, um, includes conversation, um, again, organically r arising out of these fields of discussion into these new forms of publication. Um, we focused here on history and, and maybe digital humanities, but I would say, as, as Cliff Lynch pointed out in the plenary, the opening plenary, of course, in the sciences, there's all kinds of new forms. And indeed, for far lo longer than in history, there have been forms of web-first publication, archive.org, maybe more recently, PLOS One, um, lots of stuff being pushed out onto the web. But there is this real question of how do we validate, review um, this kind of material. Um, and so that's, that's where Joan and I sort of began this project. How do we think about material that's published openly on the web but providing a kind of layer over that, um, a layer on top of that that validates, that finds important material and disseminates it to communities of interest, which has always been, of course, the function of the academic journal. How can we re-envision that in a kind of web, a web first way? Well, you look around the web and there indeed are models like this. Um, in technology news, there's sites like TechMeme that do their best to kind of algorithmically, and now TechMeme more recently has also brought in a kind of human hand to pull out the most important stories of the day. So you, if you can't keep track of the hyper-caffeinated tech news um, every day, you can just go to TechMeme at the end of the day and you'll see the eight or 10 important stories. And that's a model that's been very effective for them to um, sort of aggregate and curate um, this material. There's all human models, like the browser, which was started by uh, one person in London, to find high quality, um, long form writing. Um, very popular site, gets lots of visitors, and again, pulls things from open venues of writing, um, puts them up on one site, um, again, sort of validates it as high quality work. Um, food press, not often talked about in academia, um, although. Um, we are foodies, I guess, and um, so uh, a site like Food Press is really interesting. It takes recipes found in uh, WordPress.com uh, blogs. So WordPress.com is now hosting tens of millions of blogs, and there's lots of foodies there, and they're putting up recipes. And Food Press, which is actually produced by the WordPress folks, um, again, pulls the best stuff um, best onion dip recipes um, <laughs> from the giant sea of, of all those blogs and creates a kind of um, vetted high quality location for finding all the posts on vegetarian food that you'd like to get. Um, again, narrows it down, whittles it down. And I think we've seen this again and again on the web. And I think we're actually in a moment right now um, where lots of people are talking about this real need to kind of anthologize and cut down on the, the, the vast sea of material that's up there on the web for communities of interest. Um, there are sites that do this, again, based on your particular interests, like Paperly, um, Tweeted Times. A lot of these are, are social network based where they read through your, your uh, Twitter stream and tries to pull out links that are being retweeted a lot and puts that forward into a kind of daily newspaper just for you. But of course, the problem here is that we don't get that kind of validation. Um, this finds things are important to you, but of course in academia we care what is important or valid for all of us. And we need that sense that we're all kind of reading the same things. This is one of the things that academic journals do really well is that we know that the handful of articles that come out in a particular journal, the American Historical Review, that most of us in our profession will at least leaf through that and get a sense of what's there and um, find important work. So, Thinking about that, we put together this project, Press Forward, pressforward.org, um, where we, as we say in our motto, sort of bringing together the best scholarship from across the web, the open web, to produce vital open publications scholarly communities can gather around. Our idea is that there's high quality material out there 
It just needs to be organized in some fashion and, and validated and then sent out to an awaiting community that doesn't want to wade through um, hundreds of blogs or thousands of, of websites. So this is our model, which is a, a very different model than the, um, uh, again, submit model that you'd get for an academic journal where you send in um, your Word document or PDF, you wait six months or a year, um, you get some thumbs up or thumbs down or revise and resubmit, and then you wait another couple of years for your piece to come out. Um, we try to work a little bit more rapidly, but also in a kind of layered fashion. And our feeling is that there's always been layered review in uh, academia. It just hasn't been that apparent because we have this binary world of the journal where something is accepted or rejected. It can only be published in one place, which is very unweb-like in the way that we link to good things from multiple different locations. So we are trying to find things out there on the open web and slowly go through a process over time of vetting that into what looks like a journal at the end. So we start again with that open web. So for instance, in digital humanities, and, and Joan will we'll talk about this in greater depth in just a second, um, there are hundreds of blogs in digital humanities, hundreds of institutional places, centers like the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, where we put out new projects and new software tools and all kinds of things that are part of, of DH. Um, lots of things out there on the open web. Um, every day, uh, Joan and I and um, a, a wide variety of other editors will sit through this, and again, Joan is going to get this into this um, in more depth in just a second, to find um, important new material for that day. And we have a kind of daily relevant content section. Um, we also have a kind of editor's choices where we actually go through and do another layer beyond just what's being retweeted the most, um, go through and assess content for quality, new projects for their quality, and we'll make editor's choices that we'll push out um, to the subscribers. And then every 90 days, we actually have a journal which is the best of the best. So we might start with 15,000 blog posts at the bottom of that pyramid. We might narrow that down every day to eight to 10, just like tech meme of sort of, hey, this is neat. We'll get to editor's choices, which is a narrowing of that. And then to the quarterly journal, it might be only 10 or 12 articles, projects, um, other things that we've identified on the open web that are really worthy of, um, of greater um, uh, engagement um, and validation that will end up in the quarterly journal. And again, we, we haven't come up with a better term for this, um, but we do view it as a journal, and indeed it, it will look like a journal when we go through that. Um, so I think I'm gonna hand it off to Joan, and she'll walk through the process a bit more. So Digital Humanities Now um, is a this sort of now publication, the weekly publication. Um, since November 2011, so just over a year, we've been working in version 2.0. And um, version 2.0, as Dan mentioned, includes an in-house editorial team. Uh, Dan, myself, and we have two graduate students, um, Jerry Waring and Sasha Hoffman. And so what we did as a group is we um, developed some criteria for what we thought would be um, useful in ways to identify content for the editor's choice category. And previous iterations of this had been, Dan is a single editor in version 1.5, um, very time consuming job, and in the version 1.0 was fully automated publishing. Um, so we decided it was worth a try having a little bit more editorial control over this. So for the first seven months, we published uh, five days a week, um, and since June, we have published two times a week. Um, thinking that that is about all the attention our readers have um, for new content and also it allows us to be a little bit more selective in our um, choices. So since uh, November 2011, we've um, published over 1,200 posts, over 1,200 pieces. Um, and what we publish are editor's choice. You can see that in the left column there. Um, these are pieces that we've identified as moving the field forward in some way. They are reports of research in progress. Um, they are comments on the shape of the field. They are really about scholarship. Um, what we do is we select an excerpt from those pieces. We select an image, um, and then we provide a link back to the original. 
And so in the editor's choice category, we're trying to sort of take the pulse on the latest work in the field. And we only have a, um, usually one or two editor's choice pieces a day, so only up to about four a week. If you really want to know the most latest work going on in digital humanities, we'll pick the four things for you to pay attention to on any given week. So that means that we can identify conversations and trends that are happening in the digital humanities field, and it helps inform our um, selection of content for the Journal of Digital Humanities, which I'll talk about next. Um, and sometimes what happens is there's a decent amount of conversation about a particular topic, and then we'll do something called a roundup, where we'll select excerpts from maybe three or four pieces that are all kind of on the same topic and group them together. So we just had one, um, a roundup post, we call them, on December 4th, so last week, and we've already had 475 unique views of that. And what we do in that roundup is we provide an excerpt and a link back to the original for four um, individual, in this case, individuals who are writing about the same topic of text mining. So we're trying to surface and um, redistribute good work, call attention to the good work we see out there. And then we also provide, and you'll see in the second uh, central column, um, news, information for practitioners and scholars, things that everyone would like to know about, uh, such as jobs, calls for papers and participation, new reports that come out we think would be valuable. And in these cases, we provide uh, just a sentence or two with basic information and a link back to the original. So our goal here is to send visitors back to the original source. We're trying to give the um, authors and creators of this content full credit. We're just trying to help draw attention. We're trying to ag aggregate the attention on these, on these um, scholars and on these activities. Okay, so this is a very basic model of how we do this. Um, we aggregate content related to digital humanities. That's digital humanities on the web. It's a big funnel there. Um, we collect uh, content from the open web, most, um, the most open web using uh, Google Alerts. Um, we also have a registry of self-identified um, practitioners of digital humanities. So people who have volunteered their name and their um, you know, I, uh, um, affiliation as working in digital humanities, and we have over a 1,000 um, folks in the registry. And then from, those, um, from that registry, we have about 600 feeds off of people's um, or either their personal or their institutional blogs um, or websites. Um, we have about 600 that we subscribe to, and we call that our compendium. So these are self-identified, and then also we do a little bit of searching around too to add to add people when we see new products and new new um, work. So we follow over 2,000 people on Twitter also, which actually isn't a very large uh, number given that we have over 6,000 followers. So we're trying to build up um, our follower list on anyone who looks like they do work in digital humanities. We're going to be following back, and we're back through our records to increase that. So all of this um, coming into this big funnel results in approximately 1,000 posts per week, of which we publish about 20. So you know something on the order of four editor's choice pieces, and then maybe 16 items of news. So that's actually a lot to filter through. And obviously, not all 1,000 um, posts are relevant. Um, they're not always. Uh, Related to digital humanities scholarship, um, many people use their blogs for many other purposes. So, but there is a decent amount to, to filter through. So, we're trying um, out a few different methods of how to filter through this. Um, we're using free services here. Of course, there are services you could pay for, like um, Fever or Percolate or two. But we um, have customized a Yahoo Pipes filter actually, where we're playing around with keywords and, and different ways to to do that. We also use Tweeted Times, which identifies the content that's most shared from your Twitter, uh, among the people you follow on Twitter. And we're currently developing a prediction and recommendation system with some computer science faculty at George Mason. So we're working on a more um, customizable, al algorithmically, more obvious, open algorithmic um, filtering that um, is something we intend to make available as part of the 
project deliverables, which I'll mention a little bit at the end. And the other, um, and at the moment, most useful way of filtering through all this content that we have is we have a lot of volunteers. And this is something we um, began in June. We have uh, weekly volunteers. We call them our editors at large. We have approximately 70 that um, have signed up so far. So every week, there's about four to six people. We ask them to commit to about an hour a day of looking through um, the content coming in. And so you'll see that they are receiving the aggregated feeds, just like the editors in chief. Um, and then they actually do the first round of, of uh, filtering through. They do the first round of review of the content. And then they suggest items that they think would be valuable to redistribute. And this works very well. We did, for a number of weeks, look at everything in addition to what the editors at large were selecting. And we, I think, in only one instance, found something that had sort of slipped through the cracks. So we found that our editors at large are very good at what they do. They know the field. They're volunteering their time. And they're providing a great service for us. Um, because when it was just the in-house editorial board and we were uh, publishing five days a week, that took about 15 to 20 hours a week. So that's not necessarily a sustainable or replicable model um, for most for most other fields. So with the editors at large and the scaling back to two times a week, now it takes only about four hours a week to publish. And then we have an additional hour or two for the managing the editors at large and managing the feeds and things like that. So that's a much more realistic um, amount of time for someone else in another field if they wanted to begin their own publication to, to take on. So that's how we um, get the content into the site. Um, and then the main way we reach our audience is actually through Twitter. We have over 6,500 followers on Twitter. Um, we also offer RSS feeds out. Um, so we have a lot of subscribers um, to our own RSS output. Um, and then you can also sign up to have uh, the content emailed to you as well. And every time what we're sending out, again, is a link back to the original, sending the uh, re reader to the source and to the producer of that content rather than to us. It's not about us. It's about surfacing everyone else's work. So we've had um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of visitors to our site. In addition, we had over 41,000 unique visitors so far in 2012, which is, uh, I think, pretty significant um, if you consider the range and the reach of um, other kinds of print-based um, publications. So we're doing this using WordPress, which this is a little bit light, this image, but um, it, basically this is a, a, a view of the um, publishing side, the back end of WordPress, um, where you can see each post is identified, um, has, a, has a separate um, spot for it in the database. The interface is very easy to use. It's meant to allow you to easily publish on the web, and so um, it, we use it for that reason. And also, it's open source and extensible. So this is something that anyone could use. And in developing our, um, our, our uh, method, and our, we're basically going to be developing a platform to help others do this work as well. And that's going to take the form of a plugin for WordPress. So it'll be um, a way to um, improve the already free platform. We're going to offer a free plugin to them to continue that improvement. So going back to the pyramid, um, that is uh, how we go from the open web to the relevant content to a field. That's the compendium and the radar, um, the uh, following our followers and things such like that. And then um, how we select our weekly items, the now items. And then what happens at the end of the quarter is that we review what we published in the previous quarter. And we're on a very um, quick turnaround time, in fact, because we publish the best of the previous quarter by the end of the next. So we have a three-month turnaround time to identify the best content, get in touch with the authors, prepare the final versions, and then release. So it's definitely a quicker turnaround than, um, than traditional publishing. So what this is an example of our um, 
Altmetrics spreadsheet we've got here. So we review all the um, edit, uh, editor's choice pieces from the quarter. We identify topics and conversations and trends from that period. Um, we use traditional editorial, editorial criteria, what was um, used an interesting methodology, had interesting results, was the most um, polished, had the most um, um, interesting results. Um, anybody using new sources, things like that. Um, and we also consider what will have the most lasting value. What is the content that someone is going to want to assign to a, to a class or something that someone's going to want to be able to come back to if that individual scholar's blog no longer, um, op, you no longer offers um, that particular piece, the Journal of Digital Humanities can offer a home for that. And what will, be, what will we want to be able to reference in the future? That's what we have in mind when we're selecting our content. And then we also do some basic alt metrics here. We think about the number of views on a particular post, how many times it was clicked or retweeted. We also pay attention to the number of comments on pieces. This is part of the goal of sending people back to the original, is to encourage a conversation on the site um, of, the, of the author and the producer. So we pay attention to how many comments have been written since we featured the site. And so um, after we um, identify the content we'd like to reproduce, um, we do, we've tried um, several different things in terms of getting the content um, from the original format into the journal. Sometimes we, uh, at the, for our first issue, we tried an open peer review, um, or we might say continued open peer review because these were already published on the open web and open for comment. Um, and then we work uh, with authors individually to revise their work as well. Another thing that we do is we solicit reviews of tools and projects and exhibits. Those have been the topics for the first three issues. And um, like I said, we publish one quarter later. So July and August and September quarter will be out um, by the 21st of December. So we're, we work on that kind of turnaround time. So uh, the next slide is an example of um, the interface for editing a single post. Um, and you can see at the bottom we use a, a plugin called Edit Flow, which will also be improving and returning back to the community as a way to communicate with authors. Um, the comments live here. They also can um, be emailed to the author, so you have different ways of um, communicating. And then we um, uh, do the normal WordPress um, items like select the category and choose which pages it should show on, it should appear on, et cetera. And then we end up with this front page, which um, is a scrollable, a scrollable page on, on the live web, but not in the presentation. Um, so the other thing that we do is we prepare um, uh, versions of this for uh, download, so versions that are portable. At the moment, we produce EPUB using the Anthologize plugin, which is very easy. It takes about a minute to do. Um, and we produce the, an iBooks version and the PDF from the iBooks, uh, from iBooks author, because we wanted to have a little bit more control over what the end product looked like, and that was the best way to do that. Um, so these are a couple pages from um, the second, um, the, our second issue. And you can see we can include um, images and we can format them. We have a nice um, two column page view. We can include as many images as we want. On the, on the, pa on the site themselves, you can open them up and, um, you know, to see more detail. The other thing that we've been able to do is for the HTML version that's accessible through the website, we um, can host multimedia. So in our first issue, we had some podcasts and we had videos as well. And that's something that was not reproducible in the EPUB or iBooks or PDF, but still exists online. So our first issue was particularly large. Um, we had 125 two-column pages in addition to about four hours of uh, podcasts and two videos. Our second and third issues have been roughly 80, 85 two-column pages. So we're talking about a lot of content that um, was produced on the open web. It was available there, and we helped to identify it and then um, make, give it a 
alert of the audience in the hopes that it would be seen as a, um, a valuable thing to do to put your work out. So the journal so far, um, our first issue was released in March. We've had almost 31,000 unique visitors and al already 1,000 unique visitors for the month of December and we haven't published, uh, we haven't released an issue since October. So again, this is a large number for uh, an, a journal, particularly a brand new journal, I think. So we have another prototype that um, is being worked on sort of within uh, George Mason, Global Perspectives in Digital History. This topic is big enough to warrant um, a, um, a separate publication um, from Digital Humanities Now. What's interesting about Global Perspectives in Digital History, one of their challenges is that the system is multilingual. And so there's, um, at the moment, German, uh, uh, French, and English, and there's, um, Italian and Spanish editors being um, being uh, brought into the loop as we speak. So you can see we have a um, tran Google Translate um, option up at the top. And so one of the challenges of this is not only the, um, the translation of the material, but also working with a distributed editorial board that is monitoring this uh, work in multiple conversations. We also are helping others outside of uh, George Mason work on this um, problem. We've had, we were approached um, by uh, Michael Vandegrift, a librarian at Florida State, who is interested in having a similar publication for open access materials. And he um, contacted us about six weeks later. He had open access now. And he's running on the same model that Digital Humanities Now is. We helped him um, understand how to collect the feeds and how to evaluate the content and then helps obviously build the site it looks very similar to digital humanities now so what we're um, looking to do next uh, in addition to continue to refine our methods uh, with digital humanities now in the journal of digital humanities is um, aim to write up some of the best practices for others who want to do this work um, we're also um, developing a software platform that I mentioned, the plugin for WordPress, to offer an easier method to do this. So at the moment, we're doing much of our editorial um, review and the, of the aggregated material uh, within Google services. And we'd like to make that um, something that we host and control ourselves because a free, a free um, system is never a long-lasting system. So what we're planning to do is build a dashboard that's viewable within WordPress. So all the reviewing, editorial conversation, and publishing is all done from within WordPress. Um, currently, we have to go back to the original um, in order to select the excerpt and the content we want to reproduce. If we're drawing it into WordPress right away, we could just move it from one category, basically the review category, into the publishing dashboard without having to go outside. All the content is brought in we're saved a step, and that's actually a pretty time-consuming step. Um, so right now we have a functioning uh, dashboard, and we're going to be reworking the interface and the styling um, uh, later this month and in the next couple months, but we're planning to release an alpha functioning version um, ne early next year. So what you have here is a screenshot of the uh, reader page. This is just styled by Twitter bootstrap, so it might look familiar to you, but not the long-term look. Um, so this would be the interface for reviewing the aggregate, aggregated content. We'd have editors and editors at large, sort of in our model, would be able to access this and nominate content. Then there would be a separate page just for the editorial review. Um, as I mentioned, there would be able to draft move posts into draft mode in the regular WordPress dashboard right away, so um, that would reduce the time for publishing. So we're planning to release an alpha version that we use in our own prototypes in January, and then revise uh, for a beta release later in 2013, and spend 2013 and 2014, the academic year, um, helping others who are interested in um, using this platform for uh, working on aggregating and, and evaluating and curating and valuing um, publishing on the open web in the future. So I'm going to 
close with a few lessons learned, and I think Dan will probably supplement these as well. Um, one thing that we were very pleased to find out is that there are volunteers out there and that they will help you. They're part of the community and are interested in what's going on. A lot of the feedback that we get from the volunteers is that they enjoy reading widely. They're basically assigned to survey the field for a week or to watch it closely for a week, and they enjoy that experience and they've learned so much. We get a lot of feedback like that. Um, also, it reduces the amount of uh, labor that we have to put into publishing, which we appreciate. And if this is going to be something that other fields and communities want to do, we, it's great to be able to say, if you have enough volunteers, you can do this in four hours a week. That seems like a manageable amount of time for rotating editorial responsibilities. Um, however, when you're publishing a journal, editorial work remain, of review remains. Um, you're not going to get rid of that just because something has been on the open web and received comments before. We do work with authors, although we try very hard because of our uh, compressed timeline um, to not encourage total revision, but we're open to it if someone would like to. Um, but we're, we're thinking that time to publication is important, and this is something that we are experimenting with. It's worth, it's worth trying. Um, another, another thing that I was actually a bit surprised at is that people and groups, even in the digital humanities field, don't publish as much about their work in progress as I anticipated. I think it certainly ebbs and flows. The semester schedule certainly affects this. Um, summer was pretty productive, not surprisingly. But um, I think a lot of people are um, either hesitant or not thinking it's worth their time to write about works in progress. And, and we, I think, like to disagree. Um, and then the last thing is that there's a lot of work being done collaboratively as, and is thought about as a project, maybe a little bit less than um, the intellectual independent work of what we might call scholarship. And I think that it's maybe time to think about redefining what scholarship is. Me, it's particularly in the humanities, this is a little bit more uh, something we struggle with versus sole authorship versus collaborative work. In the digital humanities field, it's very difficult to do um, much of the work that is so impressive on your own. And yet, it requires intellectual knowledge and methods and uh, labor. So we'd like to suggest that maybe it's time to redefine projects as scholarship and encourage people to <coughs> share their experience and their work in progress because waiting three years until the project is done just so it can be announced doesn't, um, doesn't get out to the rest of the community about um, the, the development of the practice. So that's a few lessons learned. I think that, that was a terrific summary. I mean, I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, I think we're trying to do several things at one time here. Um, you know, we are open access proponents, and so we're trying to think about an environment that um, uh, I think creates a kind of virtuous circle for publishing openly. And so if scholars, and I think this has really been true in just our first year of the Journal of Digital Humanities, scholars are really excited to get into Digital Humanities Now and to JDH just because they get a huge audience for their work and they get it fairly immediately. And we're hoping that that encourages more people to publish openly. But we will admit, I think, in a moment of self-criticism that um, it, it's, I think, remains an open question of whether we can encourage in this kind of model more people to publish their work, let's say, work in progress or, or other kinds of, of new media work in a, in a fashion that we can actually pluck out um, you've won the lottery. You've you've been one of the, you know, one out of 15,000 blog posts that make it into um, the Journal of Digital, Digital Humanities. But we do want to encourage that, and we also want to encourage um, different genres to be acceptable, right? So in in digital humanities, and I, this has been talked a, about in prior um, CNI meetings, but um, there is this problem that um, you have to flatten your work out into straight, you know, narrative textual material to get credit for it. And so we want to actually credit the material in its original environment as it lives on the web. Um, and so being HTML first, being 
on the web first and accepting it as it is, as interactive map, with interactive maps and video, audio, all these things I think is, is a healthy thing for us to kind of encourage in this way. Um, the other point I would make is, as Joan pointed out, we're also in the process of trying to think about what a leaner publishing operation would look like. Um, so we have had, I think, rather spirited debates at the Center for History and New Media about things like, should we have a house style for the Journal of, of Digital Humanities? And, and most journals, you know, have a house style and they enforce, you know, some specific citation style and so forth. And we've really carefully weighed whether it's worth us going through um, the real time, which is our in-kind labor and faculty, staff, et cetera, in-kind labor to, to polish everything up into an in-house style. And so if you look at Journal of Digital Humanities, you will see that we have left some material in a kind of, um, I wouldn't call it informal, but there's a, a wide variety of styles within the journal. And we're, we're sort of testing the waters on that because um, I certainly know from publishing in a traditional fashion that you can get back notes from an editor or from a peer reviewer that really come down to kind of word choice substitutions that really aren't worth anyone's time and leads to a, an expansion of costs from the, from the supply side. Um, so um, we're, we're thinking hard about that. We're also thinking about this question of democratizing the editorial board. And so um, moving from four people in house to 40 or 400 worldwide who have this one week exercise, um, what we found actually is that it creates and, and it sort of reinforces this community spirit that digital humanities now and journal, journal of digital humanities are not this sort of external thing that are published by a commercial publisher and you're lucky to get into it. There's this feeling that it is sourced out of the community, that there are lots of people involved with validating and making decisions about what gets in there. Everyone else knows that their comments on the blogs and, and via Twitter are being assessed in a kind of ambient way, and so they feel kind of participatory and very democratic spirit as part of that, and I, I think that that helps to reduce the cost because you're not getting that sort of grudging peer review labor that you would get um, from, a, from a reviewing, let's say, for a commercial journal. Finally, I would say we are working to enhance the demand side, and Joan talked about a lot of these numbers, but we think use is really important. We don't want this to just sit on virtual or real shelves. We want people to feel that this is important stuff. And so um, the, the fact that we're getting, I think, a real exponential increase in RSS, RSS subscribers, Twitter followers, et cetera, it really means that we can tell an author, you know, you're going to get 10,000 views of that new project you launch if we link to you. And people feel that as something valid. And, and so then we need to get into the process of how do we then explain that to you know, promotion and tenure committees and all these other bodies that, that are sort of important to scholars. Um, but I think we've made some steps toward that in this first year. And I hope that in the platform that we release next year and in helping other organizations to kind of use this model that will test other parts of this model and see where it's weak and strong and make some uh, strides forward for everyone to kind of have an open access system that works in this very different way. Maybe we'll stop there and, and we'd love to have a spirited discussion right here.